Well, 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 hello WCA, Michael Mori here. We have a week three update video from the spring 2018 session. I'm gonna show you a master game. Along the way, I'm gonna be adding um, some comments, obviously, and we're gonna talk about a few very important things. One, we're gonna discuss gambit play, exactly what that means. We're gonna take a look at a concept that I like to call accelerating your development. We'll get to that soon. And the last uh, concept is the idea of constantly improving pieces. So as I go through the video, you'll pretty much pick these things up in some order. Okay, so we're looking at D4 on the move, a game played between two masters. You don't need to know the names. Uh, just trust me, these cats can really play. Um, okay, D4. If I don't want white, to play e4 very comfortably, then naturally the move d5 comes to everybody's mind. This is the classical way, hey, put a pawn in the middle. Uh, so after d4, if I put a pawn on d5, you'll see that I'm kind of covering the e4 square, right? Okay, so the second way to stop that, and by all means, my friends, at any point you can just stop the video. You guys know how to do that, right? Just stop your video and you can answer these questions. So d5 is one. And what about the move knight f6? Doesn't that also make it difficult for white to play e4? For the same reason, I have control of that square. And the third way is the move pawn f5. This is the Dutch defense, and this is the move that was played in the game. But not everything is as it seems. Just because I stop you from playing uh, e4 by controlling that square, so let's go back, d4. Let's take a look at d5. Uh, here we go. All right. There's actually this move e4 in this position. So you're going to say, hey, wait a minute. You just told me I can't play e4 because black played d5, but you can. And this is a gambit, um, which comes from the Italian word uh, gambito, if I'm not mistaken, which means to trip somebody up, to try to confuse somebody. So if you play e4 and I just take the pawn as black, you know, white's down a pawn. But the idea is the move knight c3 to try to get the pawn back, accelerating my development. Do you see what I did? How I'm using the word accelerate? It just means to speed up. So you're spending your time taking a pawn. I'm spending my time developing a piece. And by the way, when I did play e4, let's just go back. So when I did play this move, you'll notice that I opened my light squared bishop as well. So when you took my pawn and I played knight c3, uh, my bishops are both working. Don't forget, they don't have to move to be effective. These creatures have a lot of squares. I have a knight in the game. If you bring your knight out to f6, um, this gambit is called the blackmore Deemer gambit. You don't really need to know that. And here is a concept where White says, I'm going to let you keep your pawn forever. And try to remember this cool little concept. It's the move pawn f3. And the idea is to attack your opponent's center from the side. So if it's a center pawn, you're going to attack it with either an f pawn or with a c pawn. And I'll give you examples of both. So in this particular case, if you take my pawn, do you see how it accelerates my development do you see how it speeds up my development? Good. Ben, don't say it. And Luca, don't do it. Anyway, okay. Look at this position carefully. White is down a pawn. I have six. You have seven as black. But I have two minor pieces in the game. Both bishops are free to go out and make trouble. Uh, is it worth a full pawn here? Most computers say no, but I don't like evaluating positions with computers all the time because in a real game against a real human, white gets a lot of play for that pawn here. I want to compare this uh, gambit to another famous gambit that comes from e4, and this is the Smith-Mora gambit where the same idea is played. When black plays the Sicilian, when they put a pawn on c5 on move one, they're telling white, look, I'm making it difficult for you to play d4 because if you play it and I take the pawn, the problem is if you take with your queen, 
I'm going to hit you with a tempo. And normally, white would never do that. They would never take the pawn with the queen and have black get to play knight c6 for free. But white occasionally does throw out this gambit so that when you take it and accept the gambit here after c3, does that look familiar? It's the same concept here when black played f3. It's just on the other side of the board. So let's look at it from the smith Moore again. e4, c5, d4, pawn takes, and here's that offer again. I'm giving you one of my wing pawns for your center pawn. If you accept and I take with the knight, again, I'm using the concept of accelerating my development. You bring out a knight. This is a nice classical response for uh, for black, and then white brings out a knight. So even though it is uh, black's move, they do have a tempo to kind of catch up here. You should see a similarity here to the black Mardima gambit. For the price of one pawn, look at both of white's bishops. I have two knights in the game, and I'm the only one with a center pawn. Is that clear to everyone? Let's look at the last move of the black Mardima gambit. Same exact concept just on the different side of the board. When this bishop leaves at some point and white castles this way, there's going to be an enormous amount of pressure on this file. If you look at the end of the um, smith Mora gambit, the files are different, but white is almost always going to get a rook to c1 and get a lot of pressure on that line. And after they castle, the other rook may come to d1, and you'll see a lot of pressure on these lines. Okay. Let's look at today's game. After the move f5, uh, this is the Dutch defense. White actually introduced a gambit here and can actually play the move e4. And a very similar thing happens to the other openings that we looked at. The only difference here after the uh, Dutch defense is white is making this move e4 to open the queen's diagonal. Now look, that's a pawn. Black took it. It's like, okay, I'll take it. And what uh, white does first is they play this move knight to c3. And the idea of knight to c3 is once this queen is open with the check, and it always was open, the difference with the knight on c3 is white is threatening to get their pawn back right away. And what they're telling black is, hey, look, if you give me that pawn... Uh, and I get it back, then you have to tell me why you weakened all these squares on this side of the board, because you don't have a center left. And it gives black an opportunity to go wrong. And in the game we're going to look at, black made kind of the second best move in this position. They just protected the pawn uh, with their center pawn. But it's kind of not best. Pause your video and see why pawn to d5 might not be so good. Okay. What did you get here? Well, after queen h5 check, you'll see that that's a kind of nasty double attack. You're not only hitting the king, uh, but you're hitting black's d pawn as well. And this is a problem. Um, you don't want to move your king to get out of this check because uh, after queen takes d5, you can just put this on a board at home. Uh, not really very pleasant. You're going to lose the e pawn next. And not, not only did white get their pawn back, they're probably going to go up a pawn and your position is not going to be too pretty, especially with your king in the middle of the board. So what happens here after queen h5 check is you block it with the pawn. Now, white gets the pawn back, but they don't necessarily get both back so quickly. After queen takes here, black has a problem. What to do? We could trade the queens but if you do, then the knight hops into d5. And there are some issues here on c7. I'm threatening to take the c-pawn and win your rook. Uh, if you try to move your king over, um, you're probably going to get a hit with a move like bishop f4. And you have problems on c7. Um, let's do some tactics. You can protect c7 with the knight on a6. Not really very good, though, because I can take the knight. Uh, if you don't want to be down a piece, you take back. And then a pretty cool move. Knight takes c7 hitting the rook. So I win the pawn back. I mess up your pawn structure over here. 
you move your rook out of danger and it appears that you're getting some counterplay down here on my b pawn but then i just play knight e6 and i like when i say i'll just play it like i'm the one that's doing this it makes me feel like a grandmaster you know so anyway let's let's uh, get back to the game here so if this happens here you're probably not interested in taking my queen in the middle of the board so let me go back this is right after white took on d5 so if black doesn't want to trade queens there they can try to gain a tempo with knight f6 and they will i mean the knight's hitting the queen and um she's gonna have to move but here in the game white trades the queens because remember white did recover the gambited pawn they got it back and when black takes back the problem they're going to have it's not necessarily the fact that their king is in the middle it's more the problem of how to coordinate the black pieces where exactly are they going to go to attack white's position and what are you really going to plan here if you look at white's position and i'll take you through some of the ideas that the player with white had because i did see some notes in this game white made some very very interesting comments they said basically there are a lot of common sense moves that we can play with white here developing moves that have definitely have a reason so bishop g5 was played the reason pretty simple i want to weaken the e4 square the bishop is not in a rush to take the knight it's just a way of developing the piece and weakening a square on the opposite color isn't it funny how a dark squared bishop has influence on the light square but black plays tactically and plays bishop to g7 now when you play bishop to g7 it opens the top rank for the black rook this cat here in the corner if you think you can win my pawn with bishop takes knight removing the defender uh you'll run into some problems because black will not take with the bishop they'll take with the pawn and when they take with the pawn you'll see that it opens the e-file so in case you take it you're going to get pinned you protect and then you're going to lose your knight you guys see that so it's a pretty pretty nice way to protect the pawn so let's go back to bishop to g5 you might say to me well then if if you're not going to take the knight and win the pawn why did you put the bishop there in the first place well it's deeper than that it's only to weaken the center square develop the bishop and what can black uh i'm sorry what can white do on their next move based on bishop g5 they can castle long the moves are just beautifully connected nothing fancy but still very effective black to play they develop their light square bishop they protect the pawn in the middle so black's already admitting that they're probably going to be a little bit defensive here because they're worse but they're not losing but they're worse white develops a minor piece bishop to c4 i mean just look at all of these beautiful light squares why not put your bishop on c4 very logical move uh whether there was better or not in the position um we can't criticize or analyze every possible move but according to the notes in the game white's saying look i'm just going to put my pieces on good squares black is pretty much saying the same they play knight to c6 and then an idea that we learned earlier gets put into play white wants to develop the last minor piece how well white uses the trick that we learned earlier and tries to speed up oops sorry went too fast tries <laughs> i really wanted to speed up they want to accelerate their development remember the trick pawn f3 there it is pawn f3 let me take you back to let's say the black mardemer gambit which is here on e4 you took it knight to c3 knight f6 and pawn f3 there's that same idea the same trick if you take it i take back developing the knight accelerating my development okay let's take you back to the real game if i can find it here we go white to play 
You see the concept? Now, does that mean you should always play f3 if there's a pawn on e4? <laughs> Absolutely not. You'll get crushed in a lot of games, and you'll yell at me, hey, Mike, you told me to play f3. I told you nothing. So here, pawn f3 is actually a very good move. Um, it's kind of hard not to take on f3 because if the pawn takes in the middle, um, hitting the bishop, this game's going to open up so quickly. Um, in either case, this is really, really a good move. I, I don't know that you want white taking on this square. Um, so black took. Clearly, we take back with the knight, just accelerating the development. Remember, the material is equal. And black fights back. And they hit you with pawn h6. And if you're going to trade a bishop for a knight in an open position, um, you have to make sure that you can really justify it or explain to yourself why you're doing it. White took giving up the bishop pair. Black takes with the bishop to keep the pressure on the middle and keep the bishop active. But the reason they do it is because of the move rook h to e1 which is really another concept. It's called bringing in the last piece. When you play rook h to e1, now you have complete control of the center and you're giving black a problem. Do they have two bishops in an open position? They do. However, the issue is, what do you do with the rooks? And now I'd take a moment if I were you, pause the video and just compare the pieces for each team. Okay, hopefully you did that and you'll see that white's rooks especially are so much more effective than blacks and that's only because of the bad placement of the king up here on, on uh, d8. So black makes the best of it. They put their rook on an open file. And remember that is an open file. Even though there are three minor pieces on it, that does not define the file being open or closed. It is only defined by pawns. So the F file is the only open file. There are a couple of half open files. This is half open for white. This is half open for black. Just think about it if you were a rook. It would be better for white. And if this king were a black rook, like if I could slide this guy here, clearly the black rook can use that half open file. All right, so in the game. When you're fighting against two bishops, one way to get your opponent to give one of the bishops up is to take a knight or another minor piece and put it on a square that says to the bishops, hey, look, if you take me, if the light square bishop takes, then I take back and I got rid of one of your bishops. If you don't, like if you move your bishop away, then I can take the dark squared bishop. You guys see that? But the reason this knight is here, it's not just to give the bishops that headache. The knight has a penetration square on black side of the board. Do you see it? Yeah, it's the c5 square. So if you, you know, let's say you desperately wanted to keep your dark squared bishop and you played bishop to g7, then you're going to get hit with knight to c5. And knight to c5 is a move that you can see that 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 knight is hitting two squares e6 and b7 the problem is in the game after knight e4 black realized that knight c5 was a big deal and they played pawn to b6 it's it's really the only way to stop knight to c5 but the problem with that move is if if i put on some other highlights you see all the light squares that are kind of opened up it kind of it should look like an x to you and that's because, let me turn these highlights on, when all pawns in one zone are on the same color, it creates like a T effect, the letter T. You see, if you look at all the dark squares that I highlighted, you can kind of imagine it, uh, imagine it being a T. And then if I highlight the open squares, you should see the letter X. You got that? This is the same idea if this bishop were here. This is a fianchetto bishop, correct? Yep. Fianchetto bishop. Problem, problem, where is this bishop? It's over here. And when that happens, if you can get your opponent to weaken this many squares on one side of the board, and the piece that can defend those squares is on the other side, you've created a legitimate weakness. 
You guys, I hope that makes sense. So from this position, as soon as this knight hops in, the knight is telling black, hey, look, I may take one of your bishops off the board or I may penetrate into your position. Choose. What do you want to do? So black decided to weaken uh, those light squares and white immediately jumps on them, pinning the knight. Forcing the bishop back. You don't want to put your king on d7 in this position. And now, how to improve your position. Put your pieces on good squares. If you don't see something concrete, you know, at the WCA, we never make a trade unless the trade helps our position. If you think taking this knight and putting this bishop on this long diagonal helps you, then do it. White simply put the rook on an open file. Could you take the dark square bishop? You could at some point, but this is a strong knight here. And go a little bit deeper. How does black get rid of this knight? Not so easy to do. The bishop's not here on f5 anymore. So white will make a trade with this knight at their convenience. But in the meanwhile, in his mind, he said, you know what? I'm going to put my rook on f1 and just start to fight for the only open file. King e8. This is a master move, opening up the square d8, possibly for this rook to break the pin, and then protecting a piece that is loose. Let's go back. Who's protecting the rook on f8? Nobody. What is the rook in the corner doing? Nothing. Is the rook pinned? So what is black trying to do? Protect a loose piece, open a square, possibly for the rook to break this pin, and now, and only now, after that king committed himself, did white take. The problem for black now is taking with the e-pawn uh, is, you know, you're opening the file directly in front of your king. So when you take back with the rook, it gave black this headache now. Now the knight hops in. And what is this concept that black is facing? It's called putting more pressure on a pinned piece. If you don't take it and play a move like rook to d6, because that's you have to keep this knight protected, it's attacked twice, the rook is on a funny square. Does everyone in the room agree? I do. I don't, well, actually, I'm the only one in the room, but I agree. That rook is in a box. They don't belong there. You should immediately, immediately see that this rook looks funny. It's completely boxed in. The white king in the center of the board, active bishop, look for tactics. I don't know. How about knight takes pawn? Does that win a pawn? What happens if the rook takes the bishop? Checkmate on f8. What happens if the rook takes the knight? Bishop f7 check, gets the material back and more. White is winning. Okay, you guys see that? So when that knight hops in, the rook opens up, the knight is centralized, the pin, the effect of the pin is really felt. How did it happen? By improving a piece, forcing a weakness, jumping on the squares that got weakened. Excellent. He took. White wins in exchange. Rook for minor piece. The knight here is hanging. Knight goes to g4. Rook takes pretty much forcing knight takes. Because if you take with the pawn, you're going to run into check. When you get out of check, now the knight doesn't have any good squares. Attack the knight, only safe square, win the knight. Isn't that amazing? Just by the placement of the pieces being active. So when the rook was traded, the knight had to take back. White is up in exchange. To win from here, more common sense. Get the bishop out of harm's way. It's sitting up in the corner with absolutely nothing to do. Why did it go there? It won a rook. Once it won the rook, time to bring it home. Cover some squares on this side of the board. Bishop to e6. No need to worry about the a pawn. King d2. This is an end game. Centralize it. If they take, you can maybe give a check and then mousetrap the bishop. Oops, not getting out of there. After king d2, g5. I don't know, maybe bothering the bishop a little bit. White is not concerned. They shut the bishop out for good. 
They attack the bishop. You give it a check. King went to f8. White played one move. Black resigned. Yep. Rook f1. Just pin the knight. There is absolutely nothing black can do in this position. You can actually walk your king right up to the middle of the board. At some point, maybe give up the rook for the knight and a pawn with your centralized king. Extra pawn. There is no way that black's going to hold this position. All right, my friends. Long video. Well, not long for me. My age? Nah, I can do 25 minutes. Can you? I hope you're working on your books, your chess, all that good stuff. See you soon.